time to talk a little Florida State quarterback recruiting. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome everyone. I am Brian Smith and thank you for joining Locked On Seminoles and making it your first lesson each and every day. Today we're going to start with some quarterback recruiting and talk a little bit of discussion about what's the best style of quarterback for the Seminoles long term. Is it a drop back guy? Somebody that can move the pocket and make plays outside the pocket? Or is it a true dual threat that can take off and score from over 50 yards? Obviously, Florida State's got a history with all kinds of different quarterbacks, so this is an interesting debate. And to make it more tangible, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about Faison Brandon, a quarterback that's going to be visiting Florida State in early June, arguably the most physically gifted player in the class of 2026, a rising junior, if you will, and a young man that quite honestly has all the tools that you could want to play multiple positions, play quarterback, receiver, free safety, whatever, just talking about it athletically. But he is a quarterback. So let's talk a little bit about Faison Brandon, what he brings to the table. This is a young man that I mentioned a couple of times on this show. He was at the Elite 11 event in Georgia earlier this spring. He was coming over from the state of North Carolina where he plays. Only had three picks as a sophomore. Very, very important stat. He understands protecting the football, but he also took off and made big plays with his feet. And he also throws the deep ball well and has a very natural throwing motion. Has some things to clean up as he gets gets older and learns the position, but just playing the way he did, and I've watched a bunch of his film and seen him throw well over 100 passes at Elite 11. This is a kid that understands touch, but he can throw a zip right into the middle of where he needs to, but around defenders. He'll, he'll get it into the tight windows, and he also can throw it over somebody and in front of the safety. Very difficult to do that, but as a young player, he's shown some of that as well, so he understands level one, level two, level three ball. That's good. Finally, the other thing about him is he's very coachable. This kind of thing is the most important to me, whether it's a drop back kid, a run pass quarterback, or guy that can just move the pocket. If you're not coachable, it doesn't matter. The guys at Elite 11 did a good job with him, which they always do, all the quarterbacks there, but there were several elite players, and they coached everybody the same. And Faison Brandon was cool with it. When he made a good pass, they'd applaud him and tell him what he did right. If he didn't do something, he took the coaching and went to correct it. So I, I want to give him some praise. A lot of guys that have a bunch of offers early on in the career, you know, the Florida States and all that come in, it's easy to get a big head. He didn't care. He was a guy that was there to learn and get better. So with that, he's going to visit Florida State in early June. He's got Tennessee and a whole bunch of other schools he's going to visit too. He can pretty much pick his school. He's 6'4", 195 pounds. Um, he plays at Grimsley High School, if I remember correctly. It's a pretty, pretty good program there. They went to, I believe, the state finals last year and got beat. But really good quarterback, only had three picks, and he can make plays in a lot of ways. So that brings up the question. For you, whoever you like, if you want to talk about a favorite quarterback at Florida State or in the NFL or whatever, post it to YouTube, comment. I'd like to hear your thoughts. But why you think that style, here's the key word, not the player, the style of quarterback is the one that you prefer quarterback at Florida State would be moving forward? Or do you not really care and just think it's okay to switch it around? Think about this. Florida State has had a lot of different styles of quarterback. Danny Cannell, for instance, is more of a drop back guy. He was at Florida State in 93 when Charlie Ward was a fifth-year senior, and he was the next guy. They had guys like that come through, but they also had guys that can move the pocket a little bit. And like right now, they have Luke Cromahawk that is just coming into the program. And they also have Brock Glenn. Those guys, I wouldn't say are pure RPO guys, and they could run it, but they're not going to weave their way through traffic on a power four field and score from 75 yards. At least it's not very likely. A lot of things would have to go right. This is the kind of situation where I think most teams are out. They at least want their guys to be able to get outside the pocket, make the first guy miss. That's kind of where I'm at. I think that's the perfect, perfect answer because I don't want my quarterback taking a lot of hits. Just get rid of the ball, get it to your playmakers, go to the next play. That's mine. I'm okay if you have a pocket guy, but it's got to be somebody that just has a natural ability to A, improvise on the fly and switch off his reads and B, 
got to be somebody that can pick up a playbook and almost has a photographic memory because you're not going to get any yards out of him with his feet. He can't miss anything for me as a pocket guy. That's really hard. Basically, you're asking a college guy to be an NFL player because the only goal of Florida State is to win the national title. It's just true. So that's hard to do. Like Winky was that kind of guy. Wasn't a player that was going to go out and run around, but he could throw dimes. Played in the NFL. Now he's quarterback guy at Georgia Tech. That's fine, but that's the rare exception. So I prefer, preferably, to stay away from that because I just think the ceiling isn't high enough. There's not enough ability unless the guy's just incredible from the shoulders up to make it work. You can comment on that all you want. The reason, the other reason I like the guy outside the pocket, it's easier for the sight lanes. If you have a quarterback that can bootleg, naked boot, waggles, pull the guard, whatever it is, he's going to have a better view of the field. I know you're going to cut off a little bit, but you can flood one side or the other. It's something that all teams do at the college and the NFL level. A lot of high school teams do it. It's the easier way to make it happen. And again, you don't have to run down the field. If there's nothing there, throw it to the person in the second row. Do not turn the ball over. So that's my preference. I like the guys that can move a little bit. If you need five yards, they can go get it, but they're going to stay out of harm's way more often than not. Just saying. And I'm going to talk about in, in the rest of the show, some of the quarterbacks Florida State's going to go up against. I think Florida State secondary is going to be elite this year. I'm going to kind of compare and contrast. What I just talked about here, what I'm asking you to answer we're going to see a little bit of that with some of the teams that Florida State plays this year. It's a really good group of quarterbacks, but really different. There are guys that can definitely run, but there are some guys that you look at and you say, man, that's that kid's got an arm. So it, we can talk a little bit through this, and maybe you have a different perspective of it, because I know defensive guys that I've talked to over the years really hate dual-threat quarterbacks because it just adds more to their plate on where they play guys. They don't want to account for anybody in the middle of the field just standing there watching. They want everybody either getting after the quarterback or truly in coverage, not spying. Run pass, guys. If you don't put a spy there, and especially if you play man, which gives me some pause with Florida State's schedule this year because they, they can't play some man coverage, but you have your back to the line of scrimmage, that can burn you. So we're going to talk about that next here on Locked on Seminoles. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It doesn't matter if you're looking for an intern, somebody to be an assistant manager, or somebody to be a CEO. This is a company that can help you find that. It's not just a job board either. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that can nobody else can find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a job, but they might be open to a different role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit another leading job site. So if you're looking, if you're not looking on lock, on LinkedIn, you're not looking in the right place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional with LinkedIn. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, now the next thing I want to talk about are some of the quarterbacks that Florida State's going to go against. We just brought up what do you think Florida State should do, drop back, roll out guys, or pure run pass. We're going to see a little bit of all of that with the group they're going to be going up against this year. I'm not ranking them, just kind of throwing some of these out in some stats and why I think these are going to be fun matchups. I know it's more fun to root for your team when they got the ball, but Florida State's defense is a lot of fun. They've got some pass rushers, got a lot of speed on defense. They got Lundy back at linebackers, one of the best tacklers in the country. They've got a lot of things to root for. Well, they're going to be challenged this year. We're going to talk about quarterbacks, and then a few of these quarterbacks, like the matchups, are going to be interesting. They got Thomas and guys like that at corner for the Knowles. They're going to go up against some pretty darn good receiving groups, too. I'll name a couple of kids, some stats, and it's just kind of fun to get an overview after spring, after the transfer portal, kind of like where things are. In Florida, by the way, who I'll start with, with their quarterback and some of their situation, they just picked up a big transfer, a really good player. So we'll go there first. Um, not really surprising that he came back. I mean, he's a solid player last year, but Graham Mertz wasn't a guy that was going to kill you. 
And to be honest with you, Mertz is a guy that threw short a lot. Let's just be honest. They didn't trust the receiving corps that much. And it's ironic because Pearsall went in the first round, but they didn't have anybody else that they trusted that much. And then they ended up, you know, kind of developing Eugene Wilson. He was a true freshman out of Tampa, really good player. And beyond that, who did they trust? So I'm curious that now that they got Elijah Badger came in and transferred, you may not know who he is. He came over from Arizona State after catching 65 passes this past year with a terrible group of receiver or quarterbacks because they all got hurt, literally. At the end of the year, if you didn't know, ASU was running Wildcat. And he still had 65 catches. The year before, he had 70. That's a good football player. They add him. I think that's going to be a pretty interesting matchup. But what do we like about Mertz? What do we not? For me, he's a little bit too much of a pocket guy. Against a really good pass rush, and Florida State gave him some fits or would, would, would have given him some fits last year. Obviously, they got in a situation, both teams playing freshman quarterbacks last year. But he couldn't get out of harm's way against quality pass rushes. That's my fear. When you play those truly upper echelon teams, and Florida State's going to have a good pass rush, they'll probably have upwards of 40 sacks, if not more, this next season, kind of like last year. I don't think that's a good fit for Graham Mertz, Ford, or anybody else when they play Florida State. If you do not have a mobile guy, good luck to you. So I think there will be a pretty good team passing the football. Their offensive line's not great, so that doesn't help them. But at the same time, he's a sixth-year senior. There's a lot to be said for experience. Graham Mertz is a pretty good football player. They're putting it on the money, completed 72.9%. And I know he's a check down Charlie in terms of how their offense works, but he can throw it down the field. He's got a strong arm. They just really didn't do it that much. And looking at his numbers and, and just talking about him, those are stats that it just shouldn't be that way at a school like Florida. I don't understand why it would be, but it is what it is. The other thing with them – They've got to develop somebody else outside of Wilson and Badger. They need to be able to spread it around a little bit. I'm not sure that offense is good enough unless they're throwing screen game. They've got some other receivers that are talented, but why didn't they get the ball more last year, and why did they go to Eugene Wilson so much? That's my concern about Florida, and I still think that FSU will still use man defense quite a bit against them, just my opinion. If you want a team to kind of – look at it as a surprise or potentially, at least in terms of perception, Virginia Tech. Kyron Drones is really, really talented. He only threw 17 touchdowns last year, but only three picks as a true sophomore. 6'2", 230-some pounds, can run, had over 800 yards rushing. He's a guy that can throw it down the field. He's got a pretty good arm, and he's got a couple of pretty good receivers. But let's talk about the mobility factor here. Again, if possible, Florida State likes to play a lot of aggressive coverage, get in your face, take away shorter routes. That's cool. But when you play RPO teams, you put yourself in a horrendous situation if even one guy doesn't hold his responsibility because the quarterback's just gallivanting down the sidelines. That is why a lot of people really like to take risks on run-pass quarterbacks. I get it. This is a kid that can throw it, though. They can RPO you to death. I watched some of drones a little bit earlier today. Talented young man. He'll take a four-yard play and turn it into a 20-yard play with his feet, and he can make you miss, extend the play, get it to the flat, and lo and behold, it's an easy five- to ten-yard game. They keep the chains moving. With another year of experience, him going from a sophomore to junior, I'm curious to see how many more plays up the field he gets and how well he develops his second and third options. It's the bottom line. I say it all the time. Quarterback is always at the end of the day about post-snap reads. It's it's a nasty language because it's really complex, but if you can't do it, you don't ever get paid. And if you can't do it, you're probably not going to be great at the college level either, even in an RPO offense. you got to be able to read safeties and project where they're going to be to make throws down the field. So I'm curious to see how much Virginia Tech turns drones loose and if Florida State comes after him with press coverage, are they going to play zone and try to play with his head? I don't know because Florida State physically can do those things, but he's got two really good receivers. He's got Daquan Felton and Jalen Lane. Between them, they had 14 touchdowns last year that are coming back, and they've got a young guy in Bradshaw that's a talented guy. He's going to be a sophomore. It's going to, I think, going to make a name for himself. They're pretty good at receiver, and he can run. So Florida State and any other team, quite honestly, that plays Virginia Tech needs to take him very seriously. Another guy that 
I know that everybody's heard about because Florida State tried to get him, is Cam Ward. He ends up at Miami after being at Washington State, and his stats last year obviously are really good. 323 of 485, 66.6%, 25 scores, seven picks, 3,736 yards. Now, he doesn't run for yardage much, although he could. He tries to stay out of harm's way. He kind of fits the mold that I prefer. Get outside the pocket when you need it. And by the way, Washington State's O-line was atrocious last year. He was sacked 43 times, even though he's a good athlete. But he will get rid of the football at the last second and make you pay. Throw from weird, really weird angles, make it happen. But he has natural arm talent. If there's one thing about him, though, that drives me bananas, and probably any coach, he had 14 fumbles last year. That's insane. Nobody should ever have that, especially in their fourth year of college. But that's what Cam Moore did. So that's a concern. And if Florida State's pass rush gets after him and they can kind of take away some of the shorter throws, I know Miami's got a really good receiver corps I'm going to talk about in a second, but there's a chance for some strip sack fumbles in that game down in Miami this next year. Here's the deal. Last year, Florida State did a great job against Xavier Restrepo. I know Henry Williams wasn't ready as a quarterback, but they also had Jacoby George. They've got better tight ends this year, and they also got from Houston Sam Brown, the guy that their coordinator knew from when he was at Houston before he came to Miami. This is a deep and explosive and experienced wide receiver course. They got some younger guys, but they're all going to be really experienced players in the starting lineup. I'm also thinking that the tight ends will be much more involved. They only had like 18 catches last year. So they have secondary options. But one through three, Miami is about as good as any team in the country with returning talent, although Brown is as an expected competitor and Isaiah Horton too. It's hard to say which one of those will start, but they're both really good. Florida State will be challenged in that game in a different manner because they're going to have to mix their coverages a lot. Experience across the board for them. That'll be really unique in that game. It'll be as honestly about as good a wide receiver versus DB game as there is in the country this next year, Florida state, Miami, which is the way it should be. When I grew up, it was always that way. Why not now too? Another guy to talk about is one that I'm not sure everybody respects in the manner that they probably should, but that's because he got banged up last year and played in like seven games. That's, that's going to hurt you. Florida State in November has to go to South Bend. That's not the best time to go up there for a Florida team, but they do. They're going to take on former Duke quarterback Riley Leonard and the Irish. He is a definite run-pass quarterback. He can scoot. He can go get 100 yards in a game, but he can pass too. He got, ironically, he got hurt last year when Duke played Notre Dame down in Durham, and he even re-injured it after he transferred to Notre Dame. He missed most of spring. I don't really know what to think but he just keeps having the same ankle injury. Maybe he will or will not play, but when he's healthy, he's really, really talented. Big arm, 6'4", 220. He has all the tools. Notre Dame's receiver corps has taken a major step forward. They got some transfers this spring, including Chris Mitchell, a guy that can fly. He's originally from Jacksonville, played at FIU. He's a fifth-year senior. Adding that kind of speed, putting him next to Jaden Greathouse, who's probably their best receiver, is going to play mostly slot is going to give them some options. They're loaded at tight end, absolutely loaded. That's nothing new at Notre Dame. But they don't have the greatest offensive tackle situation. Both their guys just turned pro early, so they're in a little bit of a bind. Maybe Florida State can get some pass rush on them. But do not take Notre Dame's receiving corps for granted. They have speed. They've got size, great house over 200 pounds. And they've got some guys with experience, too. They're going to be a much different, much more difficult team at the receiver spot. they got Faison and some other guys. They're, they're going to be an interesting squad. So that's an interesting team. And then there's one other school that I don't think a lot of people give enough credit to, and that's Georgia Tech. I knew that I know they threw some interceptions last year. That's one thing. But even though Haynes King led the league at 16 picks, he also led the league in touchdowns, upper 20s, like 29 or something like that. They will burn you if you do not take them seriously. Keep in mind, Florida State plays Georgia Tech right out the gate over in Ireland. Be focused. Do not take them lightly. Christian Leary is a guy that can fly. He doesn't even start. Eric Singleton and Malik Rutherford had 10 touchdowns combined last year. They spread it around, and Haynes King is yet another guy. If you lose contain, he will take off and burn you. He can score. The guy can really run. It's ironic because he's had an ACL injury when he was at Texas A&M, and he's recovered from it. Really good football player. Just needs to take a few 
less chances. He threw into too many tight windows last year, had too many picks. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the overall thought process on how you handle some of these quarterbacks. That's next, right here on Locked On Signals. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Yahoo Finance is today's uh, second um, advertiser, and this is a great opportunity for you to combine your portfolio into one place. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and the data you need to have. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at financials, new cycle, breaking news, original editorial perspectives, and analysis. You can securely look at your brokerage accounts over a unified view of your wealth, including your 401k and other investments, all in one place at Yahoo Finance. For a comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, Yahoo Finance. The number one financial destination, Yahoo Finance. That's yahoofinance.com. All right. The last thing I got to mention before I forget, if you have not already made the switch, make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube and free on the Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team each and every day. So back to the original point when I brought up Faison Brandon and the overall thought process, what kind of quarterback do you want? I brought up the team's and the better ones and the quarterbacks they have for Florida State this year. I could have talked about Cade Klubnick and a couple other guys too, but you get the point. When you play a guy that can move, a guy that can change the pocket, can run RPO, can run quarterback draws, how do you think as a defensive coach? Most people that watch football, unless they played it and or coached it, think through the eyes that they, they can play quarterback. It's not as easy as you would think, number one. And number two, Having those feet still changes the game. Making a guy miss, even if you're not a true Michael Vick style player, you have to be able to make that first guy miss. That's my preference. Get outside the pocket, throw the football away if there's nothing there, but give your guys a little extra time to create separation, get open, and find the football. The other thing with it, even if it's not all the time, how often have you seen a college or NFL game decide at the end of the game you're trying to run out the clock Quarterback's in trouble. It makes one guy, just one guy, get just a little off kilter, slips through a tackle, not a runner per se, but he does just enough. Picks up three yards, steps out of bounds. First and 10, there's 48 seconds left. Doesn't matter. He went out of bounds. They're just going to run out the clock. You had to have the punt. Even though you're inside your own 15, you're just going to take a knee. Doesn't matter. Being able to do those little things to me is as big a part of playing football at the quarterback position is anything else. Being savvy in the moment, third and fourth downs, is tremendously difficult, but you took the challenge. Playing quarterback's not easy. Florida State has a history of guys that have been all kinds of different styles, but the bottom line is they got the ball to the end zone. Drop back guys, guys that could move the pocket, and then guys like Charlie Ward, who were definitely run past quarterbacks. They could beat you in a myriad of ways. That is why quarterback play is so fascinating, and I think it's why people gravitate to it and want to learn about it. So, again, I asked a question that I asked at the beginning of the show. If you could have one of the three, and like, this is what we're going to do, what would it be? And if you really want to, you can go ahead and answer it in a different perspective. Hey, we just want the best guy. If he's on Brandon, the kid from 2026 in North Carolina is that player, let's go with it. But if it's a drop back quarterback, we're cool with that too. I'm just curious to see what you have to say. So with that, I'm going to wrap up today's show. Please hit a like button, hit that notification bell, and please subscribe to this podcast and share it wherever you can. I'd appreciate it. And again, please comment. I love talking about quarterback play and all the things that go on with it. I'll see you again on Wednesday. This has been Locked on Simmons.